This is NFA Talk, the show that talks about guns and gun rights. Keeping you up to date with what's currently going on, from the newest guns, promotions, and events, plus how we're lobbying for your rights. Hey everybody, it's time for another episode of NFA Talk. Today we have special guests. We have Team NFA with us. We have Ryan Eldon and Larissa Black. And of course, joining me as always, Sheldon Clare, the president of National Canada's National Firearms Association. Hey everybody, how's it going? Great, Jordan. Thanks again. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's going good. Happy to be able to chat with you guys. Yeah, it's great. Uh, great to be on. Thanks for having us. Sure. So Ryan and Larissa are accomplished Canadian biathletes, and they've just returned from Europe where they were competing at, at Obertiliac in Austria. And you were in the Junior World Championships, if I've got that right. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, as, as far as I understand, the Canadian team did spectacularly well over there. And uh, I'd like to hear from you guys about about that, but perhaps a little bit of background. I mean, uh, I, I've, I've known uh, both of the, you as being strong biathlon family members in the uh, in the north. Ryan, uh, you started out in Quinell. And Larissa, of course, in Squamish, you're kind of a southerner, but I, I mean... I have had to move your rifle around once, uh, as I recall, and and yeah. uh, you've, you've been up and competed in the in the north in our in our areas up here where we have biathlon near Prince George. We've got a pretty active community in British Columbia in biathlon, and you know it's it's interesting to see uh, how you've developed from younger athletes into getting on the world stage and and now representing Team NFA. It's pretty cool. So, uh, Ryan, do you want us to tell us a little bit about your experience in, in uh, Obertiliac? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it was great. It was, uh, the venue was, was amazing. The, the town we were in and our, our accommodations were probably some of, the, some of the best that we've been in over there. So that was, that was really cool. Um, the, the weather and, and course was fantastic. Uh, it was maybe a, maybe a little bit warm, so the conditions were challenging. But the the organizing committee did a good job of keeping the course uh, as as good as it could possibly be. I think, um, yeah, the the team did great. Some some good results. Yeah, <laughs> mine not so good, but not exactly. Oh, what I was you, you for, did. But the, that's the how it goes did, sometimes. He did thirteenth in the relay. That's pretty good. Yeah. But, Team effort. It was uh, the boys did all the work before me, so I was on the the last <laughs> leg, and they put me in a good spot, to, made it easy. Well, it's a, it's a pretty respectable finish against the kind of, of uh, caliber of competition that's present in Europe. I know that, so that's 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 all right. So, Larissa, what were your impressions about competing over there? You you've been to Europe before, haven't you? Yeah, um, I went to World Juniors last year as well. They were in Switzerland last year. Um, yeah, this course was definitely easier than the one in Switzerland. I think Ryan can agree with that. <laughs> Less hilly for sure. Oh. Um, but yeah, we raced in the morning, so it wasn't as hot for us. Um, I think the girls had a bit of an advantage there for sure because, yeah, in the afternoon, I think it definitely warmed up a lot and the course got a bit sloppy. But yeah, I was pretty happy with my results. It was sort of the same as last year. I was hoping to improve a bit more, but... Yeah, that's just how it goes sometimes with the shooting accuracy if it's not there. So, <laughs> well, you had you had one bad round of shooting, and the others were, you know, okay. yeah, yeah. I started out not so well, but yeah, I was happy to improve it as the week went on. Thankfully, <laughs> so it, it's a lot of pressure competing on the international stage, and you know, uh, you didn't have the spectators here this time, I guess, because of the whole pandemic thing. Is that right? Yeah, there was no one watching. They actually set up little like wooded figures along the course that were dressed in winter clothes. So that was funny. Um, but yeah, no real people. So. Uh, yeah, and I, and I know uh, from watching biathlon and myself, uh, being a, a, a technical delegate, as I took my little training course, I, I know the energy that comes from having a crowd cheering you on. And I, you can see that in the athletes. And I, I just wonder how that affected people's uh, results. I guess everybody's got the same problem, right? When there's no, nobody cheering, but they have tape cheering or anything like that. 
<laughs> no. uh, I think the the range was probably a bit more calm than normal. They still had like a, an announcer in the stadium commentating, and so there there were still some things going on, but definitely not the same kind of uh, loud cheers for the the home nation that we're used to. Um, the on course was was still all right. There were lots of coaches and some of the the other athletes who weren't racing on the day were were out there cheering for us. So it wasn't dead silent out there for sure. But that's one of the things I really found about biathlon. Although it's a very competitive sport and, and largely an individual competitive one, the community seems very friendly. And you don't find this in some sports where it's you know you, you put your war face on and you don't talk to the other folks. Biathlon isn't like that at all. Has that been your experience, Rosie? Yeah, it's definitely when you go overseas, you expect it to be a bit intimidating with all of the really, you know, talented teams out there. But yeah, if you just get talking with people, they're very keen to give you advice. And, you know, I think that's really special because as different nations come together, you don't really see that. Um, yeah, like I've made friends from other teams. This year was a bit different. We weren't really allowed to socialize with anyone else. So that was made it a bit difficult to, you know, get advice from other athletes. But yeah, in normal years, you can usually, you know, talk to people that are staying in the same hotel as you. And as you're training, you smile at each other when you pass each other as you're going to the start line. So yeah, it's special for sure. Wish each other luck and all the rest of it. It's, yeah. It's much more collegial than many other sports I've, I've found. Just... Yeah, especially within the team, like um, within our Canadian team as well, like we're all willing to give each other advice on the course and shooting range conditions. And, you know, it, even though we're competing against each other, we're still uh, supporting each other till the end. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even share, I, I've seen people share rifles from teams. Like, yeah. like I've seen a, a, bro a rifle get broken and, and the person's going, oh my God, we don't have another rifle. Another team goes, here, use this. Yeah. You know? That's that's, awesome. that's the kind of sportsmanship that I really like about biathlon has a has an activity. Yeah. So, how was NFA able to help you guys in your goals as uh, as amateur athletes of competing at, on the world stage? Uh, yeah, I mean biathlon as amateur athletes, it's very self funded, um, and you work all year to hopefully go overseas to Europe where. You know, that's where the big competition is. That's your goal for the year. That's where you want to make those big gains. And without financial support, that just isn't possible for us. So, yeah, with the support of NFA, we're able to really take advantage of when we get an opportunity to make a team, we can actually go, whereas some people aren't as lucky financially. So, yeah, that means it makes a huge difference um, in just making the season worth it, all our hard work throughout the season. Oh, excellent. And Ryan, your experience is similar? Yeah, yeah, it definitely makes a huge difference in, in getting us over there. And during the the training summer season as well, we, we can spend a bit more time focusing on, on our training and recovering as uh, optimally as we can and not have to, to work quite as much as we might need to without your guys' support. So, yeah, it definitely makes a, a huge difference year-round. Well, we're, we're, we're glad to do that. And I mean, uh, biathlon is one of the disciplines we support in Team NFA. We also have pistol shooters, uh, rifle shooters, sometimes shotgun shooters. And we try to have support a variety of the shooting sports. Even though biath biathlon, particularly in Europe, often thinks of itself as a, just a skiing sport. And they, they kind of minimize the shooting. I've run into that over there a little bit. But it's, uh, it's very much a two-part sport, isn't it? I mean... It's it's two things. It's it's skiing and shooting. So it's uh, it, it's it, it's glad I, I'm glad that we're able to help support you in your goals and to help you get over there. And, uh, you know, these these NFA team NFA sponsorships are an important part of what we do to help let you be the ambassadors and diplomats you are when you go uh, to other countries or across Canada. And I, I, I hope that's. That's a, a thing we see. Now, the season this year must have been really kind of rough. You know, what other, did you actually manage to compete in anything else except in Europe? Not really, no. <laughs> there were, yeah. uh, we did some kind of qualifying races in, in a couple of different spots around uh, around Canada. So we didn't all have to, to come to one place. The, the Whistler teams did 
some races here. Team Training from Canmore events. did. Uh, events. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh God, I shouldn't say we had races, but yeah, yeah. Some uh, time trials to yeah. kind of have something to to base the the team selections off of, uh, and that was that was pretty much it. Yeah. I know it's been very rough in, provincially as we've been trying to get people to, you know, stay active in the sport. And yet a big part of that is competition. Of course, competition is all shut down. So when, when you, when you can't do that, what do you do? So I think people have been very creative about trying to accommodate and ensure that there is a level playing field for people in team selection. But how were things in Europe? Was it, was it different there in, I mean, they're having races or they're having competitions. So. What's that? What's that like? Yeah, I mean, we were tested. I think it was every three days or so. Um, so oh, it's wow. definitely they were very thorough with that. Um, yeah, and I think all the volunteers, you know, staff and everyone else was tested as well. So they were able to monitor it a bit differently. Um, but yeah, I mean, I felt safe the whole time. The mass definitely played a big part of it. You just masked everywhere except for on the course when you're on your skis. So yeah, minimize the contact between us. And yeah, like I said before, we really didn't talk to anyone else other than um, like the person we were staying in our room with, not even like our team. We weren't really socializing within even the team. So oh, no, that's yeah. horrible. Yeah, it was a bit isolating. But I mean, yeah, it's what we had to do just to get over there. So yeah. <laughs> How long were you actually in uh, Obertiliac for in the competitions? How long were you there com competing? So you had, what, three, four races to do each? And these would be, what, a day apart or two days apart? Yeah, I think we were there for two weeks total. Yeah, from the February 21st to March 7th, I think, yeah. was the time. And we had the, the first week. Uh, to kind of adjust and and train a little bit, and then the second week uh, we had a race every other day. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's pretty intense. That's a lot of work. Did so, you... so, so sorry. Um, you got you guys take your own rifles with you, right? When you when you head over there, did you guys notice any any change with going through customs or or even returning with customs? Was it was it different than any other time that you've uh, that you've gone across uh, for these events and come back? Um, I flew out from flew out from Austria um, once before um, for Worlds about two years ago, and it was quite a process. And I noticed like it went a lot smoother this year. So I was oh, wow. okay. happily surprised with that. Um, I think they're just overwhelmed with all the COVID regulations too. They kind of um, it kind of just becomes like not a background thing, but it just goes a little bit more smoothly. Everyone's I think more experienced with the law is there too now um but yeah i was surprised with that because last time it definitely took uh, like two hours for us to get through just to check all our rifles in so and and even coming back into canada it was it was uh, i guess uh an easy process as well yeah they're normally quite good here for us we can just show our licenses and they can check it out if they need to match serial numbers to to the paperwork and stuff, and and we're good to go. Oh, that's, that's I, good. I flew out of uh, Nuremberg a couple of years ago. I was there for a conference for the World Forum on the Future of Shooting Activities, and I got called back to security. I was in the waiting area. We were waiting, waiting to board to leave Nuremberg to fly to. I think I was flying into uh, uh, might have been Toronto or Montreal, and then to Vancouver, and I heard my name. And I'm, I'm going, what? That can't have been me. There's, I've got nothing. There's nothing on me. So I just ignored it. And then I heard it again. And I thought that was definitely me. So I go back to security. <laughs> and they've got my bag all all up on top of the, the bench. And there are, is the security the security guards, the Grens. And there are two uh, Deutsche Polizei officers there with their green <laughs> and everything. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, this doesn't look good. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I was just at one of the largest gun shows in Europe. Have I got something in my bag I'm not supposed to have? <laughs> and uh, this is at Eva, Eva Mesa in, in Nuremberg. And so they're, they're, they're uh, examining my bag. And on the x-ray, it shows two 
22 cartridges. It looks, clearly looks like 22 uh -huh. cartridges. Now, I, I, I know I don't have any ammunition in my bag. I, like, I, I didn't. And I'm thinking, gosh, did I bring a biathlon jacket? And I've got, I've, I've got a couple of cartridges in there that I've forgotten about. Because this is something that can get you arrested. If you don't have the paperwork and all the rest of it, you're going to jail. I, I, have, I have friends over there who are lawyers, and they told me all about this. Yeah. So I'm looking at this, and I'm going, well, I don't have any ammunition. I, it's kind of patron. And, and so I open up my bag, and I'm going through everything, and I'm trying to figure out what the heck it is. And I'm, I'm getting more and more frantic because it's getting close to boarding time. I'm going to my shaving kit. I mean, what is this? <laughs> and then I pick up a bolo tie I brought. And I had these two 22 shells, 22 Magnum shells that were taken apart. And you just has the, the ornaments on the end of the stupid string tie that I never wear that I actually <laughs> brought with me for this trip. And I go, oh, das ist meine Krawatte. And, and, the, and the two police officers who were looking like wolves ready to pounce, they just, they just turned and walked away. The, the grins, <laughs> okay, zip it up, we're gone. And that was it. But I thought to myself, wow. You guys must have to go through an awful lot of paperwork in order to be able to move firearms and ammunition. And, you, and you, you know, you're going to want to have your own ammo. You know, you've got to have your, your high quality, uh, you know, the, the different ammunition you're using. There's different brands, uh, Eli and, uh, you know, the Polar. Uh, um, what else have we, we got? Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the brands we might be using on that. But Yeah, I mean, I think me and Ryan both use Polar. Seems to yeah. be the most popular one. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you check in your rifle and your ammo, um, it really just depends who you get. Some people are very strict with it and other people are sort of more laid back. So yeah, it's definitely the luck of the draw with that. <laughs> yeah, I, I can well imagine. And, and I, I thought to myself, my experience there could have gone sideways very quickly because I was thinking, oh my God, I've got one of my, I, I, I had one of my, uh, you know, jackets that you get when you, when you volunteer at these events. And I think I have. Do I have anything in there that I'm not supposed to have? Uh, yeah, yeah. It always is worth to check uh, your bag. Um, definitely, oh, yeah. event just to make sure when you're going out of uh, European airports for sure. <laughs> have you ever run into any trouble? I think me and Ryan were together when a teammate had. Um, <laughs> I think a few loose, yeah. And, yeah. her, and uh, basically she was taken away for questioning and we didn't see her and we just thought she was going to miss the flight. And then she just showed up at the gate with the officers. So yeah, it's definitely scary. Oh, what what happened, Ryan? Um, I, I don't really remember that one, but <laughs> I, I remember <laughs> one, one time uh, an athlete had, there was a hole in his pocket. So some bullets had fallen down into the seam of his jacket Oh, and no. he, he didn't know. And then I think he wore it through the like security scanner. Um, <laughs> he just like had them and they were like, that's not going to fly. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, gave him the, come over <laughs> here. <sir." laughs> um, and he got searched for a while and uh, apologized profusely, then, <laughs> but made it out unscathed. So yeah, I've, I've seen some funny things i mean i i often travel with my bagpipes and you know you're familiar with that kind of thing too ryan given your, <laughs> yeah. your, your family and i i i actually had to put them together and play them in one airport because they weren't convinced that i wasn't a bagpipe smuggler right so <laughs> so, so I, i'm going okay you want this you got it and that's why i got up and i kept i was i was early i had lots of time so i'm gonna play <laughs> you put on a concert uh, yeah that's right <laughs> impromptu. it's good times so what's next for you guys uh, what's what's happening next in biathlon for larissa black and uh, ryan eldon i mean me and ryan are both making the jump to senior next year so um yeah, I'm hoping it'll be a smooth transition. Uh, be able to still race in Europe next year. That's the goal. Hopefully be on the IBU Cup. Um, yeah, and this summer just uh, put in the hours and hopefully we'll get some more race experience before we head over to Europe next year. That would be ideal. <laughs> well, I guess the Europeans would have had a lot more race experience because they didn't shut down a lot of the races. Yeah, I think uh, most of them just came off of their IBU Cup um circuit and went right into world so they were definitely more seasoned than we were um yeah we uh, well for me i didn't do anything other than time trials um 
before I went to Europe. So yeah, the nerves were definitely a lot mm. higher than they normally are. <laughs> oh, in other words, they were cheating. They practiced. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Ryan? What's what's happening? Uh, yeah, pretty pretty much the same. The the jump to senior uh, is definitely a bit of a, a hurdle. I think it's uh, a bit of a drastic kind of level jump from from junior to the senior category. So definitely some some work that has to be done uh, and some growth that needs to happen before we're ready to to race at that level. But uh, we've raced on the IBU uh, before and have some experience there already. So I think after a solid summer of training, we uh, we can definitely get over there again, race with the big boys. Absolutely. Now, what are you using for rifles? You know, our, our, our viewers, our listeners are often interested in the firearm side of things. So, you know, do you want to tell us a little bit about your biathlon rifles? Yeah. Um, so they're 22 long rifles. Um, and basically how it works is they're sort of on uh, sort of like a harness type thing. So it actually goes on your back. Um, yeah. And that's how you're able to ski with it. What, what brand are you shooting though? Like I shoot. Uh, yeah, so it's an Anschutz sort of like a barrel, and then the stocks are, you can pick from a few different stocks. Um, yeah, they go quite fancy up to, you know, full carbon stocks. I have a wood stock, but yeah, so, and you basically just need a, like a certain weight to the rifle. Um, ideally, you have all the weight in your barrel and less in your stock, hence like a carbon stock type of thing. Um, there's lots of add-ons you can add. You can have barrel weights that go on the end of your barrel that put the weight on your barrel. Um, but yeah. And help in for st stabilizing. And exactly. you're shooting you're shooting at a distance of 50 meters mm -hmm. uh, to your targets. And you're having to read wind. It's iron sights, bolt action only using what, Fortner actions? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a pretty complex thing. And I, people are always surprised that but the accuracy that you're getting out of these rifles at 50 meters and you're, you're trying to hit basically a four inch circle when you're standing and a two inch circle when you're prone. That's, yeah. that's a, that's a yeah, rough, rough measurement. Yeah. That's a rough yeah. measurement. <laughs> a lot of people would understand that. Now, what about you, Ryan? What are you uh, using for a rifle? Yeah, I'm, I'm the same and shoots and shoots barrel. We, I have a, a French make of, of stock, uh, from uh yeah there's a guy in france that makes the the sun sign stocks so they're mm. <laughs> quite popular i think um i think Larissa has one as well so, oh, so yeah you guys are you guys are in the cool bunch you have the the, the fancy gear that's expensive stuff too <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it definitely is not cheap no what what is a for somebody out there who's thinking okay they're, they're shooting 22s you know what? What's a twenty-two biathlon rifle all tricked out cost for someone who's competing at the, at the level you're at? Mm, the uh, the commitment for the the nice Anschutz uh, rifle with a, a decent stock is probably around, depending on uh, what kind of customizable like parts. If you have some like a special bolt knob or you need some specific butt hooks or something like that, probably between four and five thousand dollars. Yeah, the four to five thousand, four to five thousand dollar precision rifle. And, yeah, and you're basically using just two positions when you're shooting: you're prone and standing. Yeah, there's no there's no kneeling position in in the biathlon. And you also use this for summer training. Is there's a whole bunch of different types of biathlon. You can do running biathlon. You can do bicycle biathlon. Uh, you're not allowed to carry a rifle when you're when you're moving in that way, but you have a whole different range of activities, and uh, it, uh, and you've both been at biathlon a long time. Is that that's the case, isn't it? How how did you get into it? What what the uh, what got you interested in this crazy sport that uh, you you run or you go zip around with skis and you shoot at uh, little reactive targets? Uh yeah. I mean, growing up in Squamish, we. Uh always had like a uh, whistle Olympic park to ski at. So, and that range there is beautiful. It's, you know, the, the Olympic range from 2010. So I don't think it was too um, difficult for me to get started. I think for Ryan, he def definitely had some <laughs> different circumstances for ranges, but um, yeah, I just started with a 
like, I think it was like a tri biathlon club day where we all shot the club rifles and yeah, I was pretty much hooked after that. I just really like the aspect of, like you said, it's two very different, um, you know, almost sports um, and just like the um, slowing down in the range and like the fast skiing part, putting them together is definitely a mental battle. And yeah, you can never, you always are improving. It's never um, good enough. You always want to be better. So. And it's fun to see those reactive targets go down and the little white paddles come up. Yeah, that's definitely what you want. (laughs) (laughs) How about you, Ryan? The same kind of experience? I mean, Uh, it's a different uh, uh, venue than the Olympic Park in Whistler. (laughs) Yeah, definitely a bit of a stark contrast uh, there for sure. Um, No, I was after the kind of learn to ski jackrabbit program uh, in Quenelle. Uh, I finished that when I was about 10. Um, and then if I wanted to continue learning how to ski uh, and still be involved in the community, biathlon was was kind of the next step. Uh, there was no just cross-country skiing team there at the time. So I, yeah, and I, I had some friends who were, who were a little bit older from the Jackrabbit program who were, were doing it already. So I, uh, yeah. And join the club dad, and your dad competes in biathlon or has up to recently yeah 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 so when i was about 12 i think um our the coaches that i started with in quinell retired uh, and my dad stepped up uh, as the club coach because i was doing it and my sister wanted to be involved as well so he stepped up and uh, along with, I think another parent from uh, another another athlete my age who was doing it at the time. So he uh, he's he's still at it. He's still coaching in Quinell and gets out and trains as much as he can. I, I, I've always been impressed with with him when, when he's when he's competing. I mean, he's he's a serious competitor, you know, and, and and he also has a lot of fun. Yeah, he's a he's definitely a machine out there. <laughs> now, does that inspire you to do more too so you, you're like have you ever have you ever had say competed against your dad Not uh, in the same categories but have you ever gone out and tried running around with the old man to see how that goes <laughs> not for a long time not for a long time i know my daughters there... kick my butt when we go skiing now so i <laughs> is there is there any other uh, shooting sports that you uh, that you guys participate in? Any other disciplines? No, it's yeah, it's only ever been biathlon for me. Oh, yeah, okay. only, only biathlon for me as well. So, do you do you guys go to the range and shoot handguns or or shotguns, or is it is it just strictly practice for biathlon? Yeah, it's just been strictly biathlon practice. Yeah, I'd be curious to see how I'd be able to handle something different but haven't had the chance yet <laughs> one of the one of the old coaches up here uh, jeremy campbell was a big believer in handgun shooting as a means of uh, building focus for biathletes i had quite a conversation with him after he kind of got away from biathlon and he's, he's been oh, very yeah. active at handgun shooting yeah it's quite quite interesting uh, do any of your other family members uh, participate larissa i didn't i not i wasn't aware if, if you had any family members competing or doing anything in biathlon no, yeah, my parents both cross country ski, but never biathlon. They're keen. They always want to come. And I, in the summer, this summer, I did most of my shooting at the Legacy Park in Squamish. So I was mm-hmm. on my own. And they were keen to come and watch it. And I think they want to learn more about it. But yeah, just cross country skiing for them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, and I mean, when you're competing at a high level and you're trying to get to, onto the world, you know, world level, maybe go to the Olympics someday. That's certainly a goal of a lot of biathletes. And we've, we've seen some successes in biathlon uh, from Canada uh, in, in, in British Columbia in particular, Megan Tandy, who did spectacularly well. Sarah Beaudry also is, is really a force to be reckoned. She was over there with you guys too, I believe, uh, doing quite well. Yeah, she was on the World Cup. I think she was, yeah, definitely making some good results. So yeah. happy for her. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's a pretty, it's a pretty cool team. But uh, I, I guess you guys are now in your well into your isolation from having returned from Europe. Did you have to do isolation when you got there as well? And, and, and now you're in, you're in isolation on your return? How, how's that going? 
No, uh, none. None when we got there. No, we we needed a we needed a negative test uh, within two days of of our flight, and then when we got there, um, we we kind of stayed in our our bubble as much as we could, getting to the hotel uh, in from uh, from Vienna to Obertiliak on the bus, and we tried to social distance as much as possible, uh, and then we're tested. Uh, right away when we got there and stayed uh, stayed apart and isolated as, as much as we could uh, until our test results came back negative and then then we were kind of welcomed into the the IBU kind of competition bubble yes. uh, which Before. they they did get a good job of uh, making sure everyone was safe and yeah and welcome as well. I know the hospitality levels for these things can be pretty impressive, but I, I mean, it, it must be difficult with the kind of environment everybody is under with the, with the, with the pandemic, which you're still trying to do all of these things. Were volunteers quite a bit less at these events uh, than usual? Yeah, I mean, I certainly noticed um, not as many volunteers. I think they just had the you know, minimum amount that they needed just to avoid like exposure with other people. But yeah, I mean, with that, they're definitely working hard, if not harder um, than other years to get everything done. But yeah, they they did a great job for sure. <laughs> well, that's fabulous. Well, I, I think I, I think there's uh, is there, is there anything else you wanted to mention about your experience, you know, being team NFA members representing Canada, uh, doing a sport that you're both clearly very passionate about that you wanted to share with us about your activities and, and what you're looking forward to hopes and dreams and all that yeah um i mean my long-term goals would definitely be on the national team and hopefully olympics one day um yeah being on a team like nfa and having sarah on that team just makes me look towards like what can be in the future she's you know very successful and yeah, having the NFA sticker on my rifle definitely makes me proud to go out and compete as far as I can. So, <laughs> do you ever get asked about that? Does anyone say I have else? a few times in Camor just by teammates? So, yeah, I uh, give them a little blurb on it. <laughs> yeah, that's good. and I guess one of the Canadian athletes, Carson Campbell, who's on our team NFA, he's he's uh, headed south of the border to do competitions now. I think he's working with the working with the Americans. That'd yeah, I heard that. Job. But. Uh, you know, he's still he's still a Canadian and he's still still part of our team so there we are yeah, awesome but uh, and, and what about you Ryan what are your aspirations for the future with your activities in your sport yeah I think national team the the 2026 Olympics would be uh, would be really awesome I was I was a bit devastated that they're they're not going to be in Calgary uh, this time but mm. that's okay. But yeah, it's definitely uh, means a lot to to be able to go over internationally and have some Canadian brands to to represent uh, in addition to the the team in my country. So it's definitely uh, an amazing feeling. And and do you, do you feel like the gear you have, the equipment you have, is at at par with everybody else's out there, or are you you're 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 good with your gear? It's just it's just working harder and training harder and getting getting up the skills. Is there anything that's holding you back? Yeah, I think the the gear's great. Um, yeah. at, once you get to the the higher higher end of things, everything is is kind of similar anyway. So, yeah, just some some more hard work. <laughs> same thing, Larissa. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, luckily in Bathon, as rifle wise, you know, we're all pretty even on in that sense we all kind of have sort of like the same type of makes models and that sort of thing and then ski brands as well um but yeah it just comes down to who's willing to work harder so fantastic yeah. well thanks very much for joining us today on nfa talk and i hope our listening audiences enjoyed this exposure to team nfa and their activities and uh, we're, we're very glad that you you uh, represented us well at obertiliac and we look forward to watching your careers as you continue to engage in this valuable, important, and very healthy uh, shooting discipline, combining skiing with shooting, and uh, just generally being something that's one of the more popular activities in the world. I mean, 
and you get 20,000 people out to cheer you on at some of these events in Europe, it surprises me that we get a few hundred in Canada. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, well, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we'll yes, hand it back uh, over to Jordan. All right, guys. So uh, th that was a great episode. Uh, again, Ryan Eldon, Larissa Black from Team NFA. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in and listening to us. This has been another episode of NFA Thanks Talk. Thanks for listening to this episode of NFA Talk. Like and follow the NFA on social media and sign up to become a member.